as I walked along life's way. He said, you're undeserving, cause I know where you've been. I have a record of your life when you were bound by sin. And I know your darkest secrets that you with me in hell. Well, I heard the old accuser, and this was my reply. You're right for all those things I've done. I surely deserve to die. My righteousness is filthy rags. My goodness is unclean. friends, this is your friend Spencer here, and I'm glad to see all of our channel members in the chat tonight, just trying to go through some of your comments here, and some of you are already misbehaving in the chat room, <laughs> So, uh, but we thank God you're all here, and we appreciate all that the Lord has done in our lives, and uh, we're praying for you that uh, God would work in your life as well, and uh, we know that He is, and so we know He's faithful and just and good. 
And I thank God for that. So uh, looking at uh, the chat comment section there on my screen, I'm seeing Cindy Tarjay was praying for you today, Cindy. Uh, Melly Garrett's there. Got old Spark, Spocky, which is, uh, I just, that's, <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, Diana is there, and she's from Texas, I believe. Valerie McKenna is there. You got old, old brother Sky Mine, Avery F. Got uh, Sergeant Slaughter, Cheryl, Ray Matthews. Got uh, brother are her and Ivan, and then we got the River Blue, Sheila Eddy, and a Banana Rebel Right Music. Oh, that sounds like a cool name, Rebel Right Music. That just that just sounds cool. And so uh, Michael Von Heger is there as well, and Gary Ruiz, Peggy Linden Thaler. Sheila Eddy, Eric Woodstock, Illinois, is there as well. So we have, uh, we actually have uh, Diana has uh, Diana N has been reading her Bible and she is filled with the Holy Spirit tonight because she just posted this uh, no pineapple on pizza thank you this, this is a woman is blessed and highly favored amongst women and uh, she is filled with the Holy Spirit and blessed and highly favored and no weapon formed against her shall prosper because uh, her price is far above rubies and all that kind of stuff so she is a blessing in uh, in this chat today I, I might just leave that in the corner for the next little while Man, I think I'm gonna do that I'm gonna that needs to just stay there for a very long time thank you Diana for that spiritual word from the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> right there in the comment section, and uh, what a blessing that is. So just trying to go through these comments here, and uh, let's see here. Um, let's see here. Skymind says this. That's, that's a really good question. You always count on him to ask a good one. He always asks really hard ones. And so uh, what, do you, what do you say to the argument that Hillsong's Oceans is about Peter and not a Hindu deity? Well, Peter did not get called out upon the mystery. That's just a little weird. Why would they use the word mystery? There I find you in the mystery. That's the lyrics in that song. Um, really, I, I guess I would be okay with the song if it weren't for that. But Hillsong always finds a way to uh, uh, just, they're, they're masters at putting heresy all in these songs. And so um, that that's really my best comment, I would say, there. So thank God for that. Uh, let's see here. Um, jo Joanne says, Pineapple on pizza is so good. L-P-L. I think that's supposed to be L-O-L. -L. Well, we'll pray for you. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that so very much. Uh, see, Valerie McKenna says uh, her, it's her mother's birthday. So happy birthday, Valerie's mom. God bless you. Amen. I would sing happy birthday to you, but uh, people don't really ask me to sing very much. And when they hear me sing, uh, they find out why. So very good there. So uh, let's see. Uh, Sheila Eddy said it's under the blood. That is true. That is that's a that's really one of my favorite songs. Me and uh, Sarah and my wife sing that at church every now and then, and it is one of the best songs I have ever heard, and uh, it is a great blessing. So um, let's see here. Uh, Brad McCarthy says, what about tomatoes on pizza? Well, that would be the tomato sauce. Tomato is okay. Tomato is fine. And uh, so someone said, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is not putting a tomato in a fruit salad. Knowledge is knowing that tomato is, is a fruit, but wisdom says, wisdom is knowing not to put a tomato in a fruit salad. So very good. I, I, that was just a bit of, I got that from the Lord, just caught it just like that and put that out there for you. And uh, God bless you. Amen. And uh, so Crystal Ann Smith says, sing, and uh, I'll sing They Baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. I'll sing that in the live stream someday here very soon. So and um, let's see, Michael T. says this. He says, uh, I'll come up here to Denver and have a mile-high pizza with lots of pineapple and barbecue just for you. You know, I think that might be a good idea. I'm, I'm willing to try it. Uh, everything I've had so far has been pretty bad, but, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I guess I might take a trip to Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, dabble in sin just to see what it's like. Maybe I'll do that. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, funny thing, the first time I went to Denver, Michael, I was, it was years ago, me and my wife were traveling out in western Kansas, 
And uh, Western Kansas is like in the middle of nowhere. There literally is nothing out there. And I was so bored out there in Western Kansas. Uh, we started driving to Denver because I had a meeting in uh, right north of uh, right north of Denver there. So we started just driving across the interstate there. I think it was Highway 64. And uh, and like the whole time we're driving, it's about a four hour drive. I kept saying to my wife, I can't breathe. I'm like suffocating. And I kept like sitting up in my seat saying, just taking a breath. Like, man, something's wrong with me. I just, I can't breathe. And uh, I had no idea, but the elevation, of course, goes up and up and the air gets so thinner. But I, I you know, like I, I couldn't tell just by driving because the elevation is just so, so shallow going up to that, that height. You didn't really even know that you had gone up 10,000 feet and, uh, or whatever. And so, um, man, I, I was, I was in bad shape, but I got used to it. So thank God for that. Thank you, Michael, for that great comment. And, uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, just trying to, uh, um, Michelle, we says, uh, tomato, spinach and chicken on my pizza. You know, that sounds okay. That sounds okay. If like, if, if you're on a diet, that sounds good, but, uh, I like cheese and I like all the bad stuff there and, uh, that's good. So the story behind the page, this, let's see, I got, I got you in a weird spot here. The story behind the page says, I loved Western Kansas. It was pretty nice. Um, I, I do. I, you know, if I ever disappear, I, you can probably find me out there somewhere, and uh, that'll be good. So um, let's see. Carrie F. lives out there in Wyoming, and she says, Cheyenne doesn't have good pizza, LOL, or any other good food. Yeah, you know, when I think of Wyoming, I don't think, man, that was an awesome restaurant I had in Wyoming. Like I don't, I don't think that. <laughs> I tell you, I, really, in my, and this is my opinion. I think the town with the best restaurants in the world is, is, and this may surprise you, but I think the town with the best restaurants in the world is Phoenix, Arizona. Like, like every time I've gone there, I have eaten at a restaurant that I'm like years later still saying that place was amazing. That like, that was awesome. There's a lot of uh, Cajun food in Phoenix, believe it or not, that will absolutely rock your world. And I'm not even going to apologize for saying that. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. Cheyenne, Wyoming. Yeah. No, like nobody goes to, nobody gets on a, on a, on a travel website and says, you know, let's go, let's go travel to Cheyenne because there's some really good Italian out there. You know, nobody does that. So, <laughs> Uh, but thank you for that, Carrie. And uh, so uh, let's see here. Uh, Nebraska. Oh, no, we're starting a war here. Uh, Matt, Matt, let's see here. I'm trying to, I'm messing this up. Matt says, Nebraska is better than Kansas. Nebraska is better than Kansas. Is there a difference is my question, I guess. So <laughs> thank God. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, trying to find me another good question here. Brandon says, does Tai Chi fall into the same area as yoga? Does Tai Chi fall into the same area as yoga? Uh, tai Chi, if I remember correctly, is like a, it's, it's a Eastern mystical concept of, of energies in your body. Uh, like when, when you see these, um, like these Buddhist martial arts, the monks and stuff, and they talk about, you know, they, they do all these things where they're, you know, like putting their hands out like this and focusing and all this stuff. What they're doing is they believe there's a current of energy that goes through your body that is called chi. And they teach you actually when you break blocks and break bricks, a lot of them believe in focusing your chi and, uh, and that gives you all that strength and stuff. And so, yeah, all that stuff is basically different shades of the same thing. Yoga, uh, Tai Chi, um, even like, even, uh, I mean, like, there's a lot of Eastern mysticism in martial arts, and there's, there's just tons of it. So it's really hard to separate the Eastern mysticism from the martial art. And so that's the problem I've always had with martial arts. I never could find a place that, you know, that, like they want to teach you karate, but then also at the same time they want to teach you how to be a Buddhist. And I'm like, you know, I've got my religion squared down, man. I don't, I don't need your help, bro. And uh, so, but anyway, so um, let's see here. <laughs> Uh, trying to get here. Uh, let's see here. Diana says, I love the food in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, I'm from Atlanta, and uh, yeah, they got a lot of good food there. It's, it's not bad, but like Phoenix really was the place for me, and uh, that's really that's really what got me. So I know it's a, I, Ron B. doesn't agree. He says he says Phoenix is weird. I'm guessing that's what that means here. But uh, but I'm telling you, I went to Phoenix, and there was like umpteen million amazing restaurants in Phoenix, and 
not even gonna not even gonna say sorry to that. So, but anyway, God bless you guys. Um, let's see here. Uh, Sheila Eddie's got a question. Yeah, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. I'm going to answer. Uh, we did a, a post just the other day uh, on the channel here with uh, the channel members, and we ask you guys of all, you know, just if channel members leave me a question, we will answer that. And at the end of this live stream, we're going to get into that for just a little bit. So we'll check all that out, and that will be great. So let me get one more, one or two more comments here. I love interacting with you guys. And um, let's see here. Uh, Ron B. asked the question, said, what, uh, let's see here, why did you have to take down your first video today and have to do it again? Well, um, the, the reason is uh, Fox News actually filed a report with YouTube for a copyright claim on that video. And it was a it was a manual copyright claim, which means somebody sitting in a desk somewhere running their YouTube channel uh, actually filed that claim. It was manually filed. So I have had two major companies file manual copyright claims against me in my YouTube career. One of them was Disney and the second one was Fox News. And so this is I'm I'm racking them up, doing good. And so they filed a copyright claim against me. It was not like a copyright strike or anything like that, but it was one of those things where like um like Fox News was gonna make money off my video. And so I just said, you know, let's just let's just take it down and just redo it. And and I just said the same thing and I just restructured the video so they couldn't they couldn't touch me. And uh, and so that, that's all that was. But they obviously it was a manual copyright claim, which means that somebody on a computer sat down, uh, somebody who has the authority over the Fox News YouTube channel sat down and actually typed out a copyright claim against yours truly here. So I'm honored. I'm just honored. Thank you very much for that. God bless you. And uh, so it uh, looks like we have some new members in the chat, looks like, and uh, just thank God for you guys. You guys can join. If you're, uh, if you're out there watching right now, you guys can join and uh, be a part of this channel. I'm going to pull it up on my uh, my phone here so that I can just see who's, who's doing what here. And i uh, got a new member name. Named uh, the Bearded Patriot. Cool. I love that name, man. God bless you, buddy. And uh, thank you so very much for that. You you now have access to many new videos that we have in the in our channel. Uh, just some things we're actually doing. Several things we're going to be doing. New Testament survey. We just did Matthew last week, and uh, that is a great blessing. There, we are thankful for that. And we're actually going to be doing several uh, new ones. Uh, be doing probably doing the book of Luke tomorrow. And what I like to do is I like to sit down and just read the whole book in one sitting before I. Uh, before I go forward with these. And so that's what we're going to do probably tomorrow is do the book of Luke. And uh, all you channel members get to be a part of that as well. So uh, Matt, uh, Lit let's see here, Lizenberger. Is that how you say that, Matt? Litzenberger. Matt Litzenberger. My wife wants to know if you will talk about Upper Room Dallas sometime. Upper Room Dallas. You know, if you remember in 3rd Adam 3, there was this woman that was talking about, it's a whole new she was just like moaning and all that stuff, going like crazy. Uh, that was Upper Room Dallas. That so they've they've made a premiere in my documentary so far, and uh, so yeah, I will probably do a video on them. Uh, they they are one of the churches that has like uh, Lou Giglio all the time, wild charismatics and very dangerous people. I think they, actually there's a lot of videos they do with the women do interpretive dance. I mean, I'm talking about like this place is a circus. It is so bad. And so we'll do a video on that for too long. So I appreciate that. And they also just had uh, Keep Looking Up just join the channel at level one. God bless you. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. That's $1.99 a month. And uh, you guys can help support our channel, help us to produce much more good content for you. And uh, we thank God for that. So uh, let's see, you're going to go through the chat here and just look at some of the... Uh, some of these, <laughs> uh, Bruce Galusha says, uh, gonna, I uh, thought about changing my screen name to something less vanilla. That, that sounds, uh, yeah, well, get you a good, get you a good thumbnail there, Bruce. And, uh, uh, call you itself Brucey G or something like that. Like Kenny G or something. I don't know. That's just, I thought came to my mind. Don't do that. That's probably not, probably not a good thing. So, but anyway, God bless you guys. Hey, um, I want to, I want to read you something. I got something in the mailbag here, something from my email box, and uh, just had some wonderful, wonderful things here. I got two good letters, positive letters. I do get those uh, from our email. Um, this one really, 
I mean, it just, it, it was a blessing. This one, uh, as they say, hit me right in the feels. And uh, thank God for this. Um, I'm going to read a portion of this to you. Uh, this person said, I've thought about writing you for a while, but have waited. Not sure how I would say it all. How I come finding your channel in videos is my daddy, who died 82 days after the release of Third Adam 2 from heart issues brought about from decades of alcoholism. We had a very strained relationship, to say the least, and I had not been in contact with him really in months. I'm ashamed to say, but I would immaturely block his number a lot of times out of frustration and pain. God did some big things in his life these those last few months, made some big moves and caused some big separations. In his last text to me that I did, uh, that I did not receive until I saw him on his own phone. So basically she's saying, my, my daddy texted me for the very last time, and it didn't come through on her phone. But when, she, when he died, she got his phone and saw that he had sent these texts. Um, his last text to me, he said he loved me and that I, he knew I loved him. And I had been the only one to care about his salvation since his parents. And that he was sorry for everything and for me to go watch Third Adam 1 and 2 by this Spencer Smith guy on YouTube. That's unbelievable. She said, that's the last thing my daddy will ever tell me, and it was the most life-changing thing he could have ever shared with me, and I pray it was for him too. I watched them and saw the truth, saw myself, saw the answer to what I couldn't understand about why my life was still how it is. I realize in today's church I've been so swept up in the love of God that there is no fear of God. Somehow between the atmosphere and the people the, and the love and the music and the pat-yourself-on-the-back outreach and do-goodism and on and on, I've been living a Groundhog Day experience of I'm good, you're good, we're all good, everyone tolerates my sin, I tolerate my sin, God tolerates my sin, repeat and repeat. And that is just as evil as a, uh, she, she gives some descriptions there. She said it's just a terrible, evil thing. And she said, I hadn't seen it like the third Adam showed it. I knew something wasn't right for a long time, but I couldn't see how it needed to be seen to realize the truth. And I don't think my daddy had all of his life either. The greatest lie told is that you are saved when you're not. And she says, um, she said, I didn't understand that could really truly be possible. She said, I had been attending church for six years. My former pastor was a great, nice guy. Um, and she said that uh, he had a heart for the Lord. And his preaching was correct, but not. But looking back now, I'd say incomplete. She said, I don't really remember hell being spoken of before in the church that I was going to. And she's talked about how that uh, she started listening to some Ray Comfort because we had mentioned him on this channel. And uh, she said, I'd never, ever truly been born again. And uh, she said that I had never, ever really truly been saved. And she goes on to give some descriptions here and um, some, th some of the things about her life, and we won't go into that. But, um, but she says that she's, she's reading a lot now. She's reading her Bible, and that... Um, and she, you know, she goes on and gives this, and she says, God bless you and all keep doing what God has called you to do. You never know who God is reaching with and includes a 60-year-old man in Piedmont, Alabama, with 82 days to live. So she's saying to us that um, that we released Third Adam 2, and then 80, her dad watched it, and his life was changed during that time. And that uh, he went, uh, he went on and died 82 days later. So, you know, I had I had a preacher tell me not long ago. He told me he said, he said Spencer, if you don't shut down your YouTube channel, then you're me and you are through. And I, I really struggled with that because I respected this man. He was a good man, and he loved me, and I think he loved the Lord, but I think he was wrong. He told me, he said, Spencer, he said, either you shut down your YouTube channel or me and you are done. And I I struggled with that. I struggled with that. But when I get letters like this, I realize I made the right move. I did what God wanted me to do. And she said the last text she ever got from her daddy said that she said that 
he loved me and that he knew I loved him and I had been the only one to care about his salvation since his parents. And he was sorry for everything for me to go watch Third Adam 1 and 2 by this Spencer Smith guy on YouTube. I'm glad there is somebody out there saying something. And if God will help me, I continue, I will continue to do the same thing. So you guys pray for me. That's humbling. Thank God for that. I love the Lord, and I love what He's allowed me to do with my life. And I'm a happy Christian. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. This letter says, I wanted to thank you for all your videos and documentaries. I found you on YouTube about eight months ago. I haven't had a good uh, church home in a few years. I was baptized in 2014 at a church, uh, but the church has started to become sort of mega-ish. I love that term, mega-ish. And the worship service was starting to sound like Hillsong. They also used Beth Moore teachings for the women's ministry. Anyway, I needed sound doctrine because I just left the Mormon church after seven years of being brainwashed that the Mormons were the only true church. Long, sad story, but when you are desperately searching for the meaning of life and you are a single mother of children, you will believe anything. I agree with that. She said, Today I attended Grace Baptist Church, and I can finally say I have a new home church. The pastor can actually be able to make uh, uh, you know, contact with us and know my name. That's a big deal. And she said, I'll be taught sound doctrine out of the KJV Bible and singing hymns out of a hymnal. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Spencer Smith. And she gives her name there, but we won't do it here. But um, guys, thank you for making all this possible. You guys that are our channel members you um, and the folks who watch our, our videos and support us through PayPal and other things, you guys make this possible for us to do this. Um, and I believe that if any reward is to be given at the judgment seat of Christ for this, the, the efforts made through this YouTube channel, I think a lot of that will be handed over to people like you. Not really people like me, but people like you. And uh, I want to encourage you in that. God sees, God knows, God is keeping score. And at the end of the day, you know, we all have to just do what we can. And... I want to try to reach as many as I can, as long as I can, and while I can. And if God will help me, that's what I, can t I intend to do with my life. So I want to show you this. This is a post we made on our channel here today, and I want to share this with you. Um, this is something that the Lord is really speaking to my heart about, and I want to, I want to just make an emphasis here on this channel about this. Um, I made this post. I said, I don't know who needs to hear this, but stop wasting your time trying to defend yourself from people that are bending over backwards to intentionally misrepresent you. Let God handle it and go live for Jesus. And then we give 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, that we, may, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Thank God. I love that phrase that it says, the Lord is faithful. Now, I don't know about you. Have, have you ever been in a scenario before where you thought, God's done for God about me? That's Southern language for you. You think God has just abandoned me. God has forsaken me. And, you know, Lord, what are you doing? Lord, don't you got my back here? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that. I know I have. And uh, <laughs> oh man, we say, "Oh God, these people are telling things about me. They're not even so. How how in the world, Lord, would you please?" Uh, <laughs> I like. Um, I kind of like Elijah. He said, "If I be a man of God, let fire fall from heaven." And there's been a time or two I thought, "Oh God, would you just let fire fall on that guy?" <laughs> <laughs> I felt that way a time or two, and uh, and if you if you never have, then uh, you're a liar. <laughs> oh boy! Uh, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. You know they lied about Jesus. They lied about him. They said things that were not true. They lied about Paul. They lied about Peter. They lied about all kinds. Of, they lied about the children of Israel. You know. There are people in this world that literally will, they will bend over backwards to just lie about you. Now, and our channel's getting to a point now where we're getting, you know, the numbers, the numbers are getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, I think we just crossed this past week 120,000 views on our channel. I'm sorry, 120,000 subscribers on our channel. And, um, 
and you know, every now and then there's like somebody will send me a video and say, Hey, this guy was talking about you. And, and I, most of the time I don't watch stuff like that because, you know, I, I, I want to be doctrinally correct. I really do. But like when, if somebody's trying to attack a personality quirk or something of mine, okay, that, that doesn't matter. But, um, you know, if somebody's going, if somebody puts something out there and says Spencer Smith is in doctrinal error, I I will respond to that and watch that because I really want to be right with this book. I mean, I've got a Bible right here. I really want to be correct biblically. And if somebody's got a biblical argument as to why I'm not correct, I, hey, I'll hear it, man. I'll hear it. Let's let, show me where I'm wrong. I, I am. There's been a lot of times I've taken down videos because I I went back three days later and I realized, you know, I didn't say that right. Or um, that came out. There was one time. There was one time I was preaching years ago, and I I just my mouth just I don't know what happened, but my mouth just had a mind of its own, and and the words that came out of my mouth was the Bible is not the word of God, and and I didn't even know I said it, but just uh, <laughs> I guess a slip of the tongue or whatever, and the pastor came came after me. Oh boy, he said you said the Bible is not the word of God, and I said well I don't believe that. And they would play the tape for me. <laughs> sure, enough, <laughs> sure enough, I said it. <laughs> And I thought to myself, I, I'm I'm a heretic. I'm about to ecclesiastically separate from my own self, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so I I do make mistakes sometimes, and sometimes I say things the wrong way, and sometimes uh, sometimes I say the right thing the wrong way, and that's that's something that I have struggled with before. And uh, so I maybe that's just a personality character flaw of mine. I don't know. Uh, but lots of times people make videos about you and, and say things about you that just. You, you, like, I know that's not true. I know that is a lie, what they say about me. And, uh, and so what do I do? What do I do with that? Do I, do I spend all of my days trying to defend myself? Truth is, I, I, it's not about me, so why should I really do much time, spend much time defending myself? It's, it's about what the Bible says. That's about Jesus. It's about who God is. And, and if, if what Spencer Smith says is not in line with what the Bible says, then Spencer Smith needs to be corrected. I'm for that. I'm not. A, I'm not above that. I really. I'm really am not. There's. There was a time or two years ago. Um, I just started traveling, preaching, and there'd be times I'd say things in, in a sermon, and some old man, spiritual, gracious man, would come to me and say, "You know, you said this, but let me show you the verse." And they'd show me something, and and there and there'd be there'd been lots of times I took a whole sermon. Uh, on a piece of paper, and I threw it in the garbage as I left that church, saying, I, 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 and I apologized to the pastor. What I said there was wrong. Nothing, I'm not talking about like nothing major, but like, you know, my dates were off on some things, and, and uh, you know, just, just nothing really, um, nothing heretical. I mean, I wasn't like Joel Osteen type stuff. Uh, but I'm not above correction. But sometimes there's people that say things about you, and, and, and it's not even so. It is not even true what they said, and they try to get na- and and I, I think we're getting to the point now where a lot of people are putting me in their thumbnails just so they get views and things like that. And I, that's that's I, you know, I guess that's the game they're playing. But what do I do? I think I'm just going to obey this verse. Pray for me. That's what Paul's saying. He said. He said as he's going on the missionary journeys. He said, "Pray that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith." Now I want you to notice here, unreasonable and wicked men. I want you to notice unreasonable men are oftentimes wicked men. Oftentimes wicked men are unreasonable. You can't reason with them. There's no talking to them. You can't you can't say, hey, you know, isn't don't you think there's something better? You could be that they won't hear any of that. So what do you do? You ask God to deliver you from these men. For all men have not faith. But at the same time, you just have to realize the Lord is faithful, who will stab his few and keep you from evil. And when I look at that, I think to myself, you know. I, I read in the Bible things like Joseph, how Potiphar's wife, that wicked woman, that wicked woman accused Joseph. She accused him in the book of Genesis. She said, come lay with me, Joseph. And Joseph said, no, no, uh And she ran from him, and she, uh, he, Joseph ran from her. She pulled his coat off as he ran. And then when Potiphar came home, she accused him of all kinds of heinous stuff. She flat out lied. 
She's probably wearing a vote for Hillary shirt when she's doing it. Hello. And what did Joseph do? Joseph got thrown in jail. What do you do with that? Did Joseph, I mean, I don't know if he had much. I don't know if it, he had Miranda rights back then or not. I don't know if he had the right to a jury trial or whatever. But I want you to notice in the life of Joseph, even though he was lied on, even though people said things to him that were not so, and said things about him that were not true, no way, not even close. Not e- there's not even not even half true, not even 5% true what you just said about Joseph. This verse still rings true. The Lord is faithful, and the Lord was faithful to Joseph, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. I think in the end, God knows what he's doing. I think in the end, God sees, God knows, God cares. And God is faithful. We're not faithful, but God is. And that's something we all need to remember. We all need to remember that. And so, hey, I've got some great news for you guys. Um, we, we've, I've been super positive today, and uh, I appreciate all that God's doing. But we've got some great reports for the Dominican Republic, and God has been blessing that. And I want to share this with you guys because you guys have been giving uh, to our conference needs and things like that. We we raised the money for, we, we shared this last Thursday, uh, the Lighthouse Baptist Missions Dominican Republic Conference. We raised $2,500 for that. That need has been met, so praise the Lord for that. Thank you, guys, and all of you who gave through PayPal. And uh, we actually have some people that are giving through uh, mail-in checks to Lighthouse Baptist Church. Thank you guys so very much for that. Also, I uh, just want to give you another update. We uh, we also raised some money about a month or two ago for Brother Richard to get him a motorcycle. He's our main man there. And uh, we raised right about $1,800 for him. We went ahead and sent him 2000 because of taxes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that need has been met. And so Brother Richard, is uh, <laughs> he's driving around on that red hot rod. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, that's actually a pretty good bike for the price. And he needs that because he goes up there in the mountains for us and does a lot of work. We work with him. He's our main national leader there. And what a blessing he is. Also, uh, there was a church there in uh, in the central area of Dominican Republic. And I want you to see this in the top left. If you look there, there's that church. This is Brother Mele Luce's church. He's one of our nationals there in Dominican Republic. Uh, this church, me and Bill Delperdang went and preached there this uh, the past trip we took, and that is nothing more than a stick structure with corn husk all around it. And they've been meeting in that thing for months and months, actually probably over a couple of years. And uh, and when it rains, they couldn't even have church. And I'm talking about it was a pitiful, pitiful building. Uh, it, this, this building was more pitiful than Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. I promise you, it was in bad shape. And so we were able to raise the money to get them a building, and we sent that money over. And Brother Richard sent me that bottom, uh, that picture in the bottom left there. The concrete truck has shown up today, and that means money is moving and blocks are being uh, being bought. And that building is going up there in the Dominican Republic. And we thank God for you guys. Uh, all of your support helps to go fund projects like this in the Dominican Republic. And so uh, and we're also working in Kenya as well. Well, but the Dominican Republic is moving forward right now. Praise God for that. And we're thankful for that. So you guys, your giving has helped go towards this. And uh, and we thank God for that. There are treasures waiting for you on the other side of eternity there. I think one day there's going to come up to you some stranger and some somebody who speaks a foreign language, somebody who has a different culture than you. And they're going to come up to you and say, hey, you, thank you for what you gave to the Lord and uh, and you you gave through Brother Spencer and Lighthouse Baptist Missions. Because of that, I am here today. And uh, so thank God for that. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to just establish churches, get them strengthened, get them going. And this building is in progress now. And so praise the Lord for that, guys. God bless you. Thank you for your giving. And uh, we appreciate that so very much. And so we've got a, um, let's see here, Brother brother Bruce Galusha, who uh, he says, uh, when are you sending the fog lights, uh, the sending the lights and fog machines? Uh, those are coming from China. We had to order those through Amazon, so they'll be there <laughs> very soon. 
<laughs> Thank you, Brother Bruce. God bless you, man. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for what God is doing. So, um, hey, let's do this. I want to talk to you about T.B. Joshua. He he actually died this week. And if you're not familiar with T.B. Joshua, he's actually a like a Nigerian telemarketer. Or not, I'm sorry, not a telemarketer. What am I saying? Televangelist. Um, they, well, the only thing worse than a telemarketer is a televangelist, so give me credit there. Um, but <laughs> but T.B. Joshua uh, died this past week. And, uh, you know, he here's what the article says, BBC. Uh, Nigerian prophet uh, says that uh, Josh, I can't even read these words. And uh, what language is this? And... Oh, is this is okay? Yeah, okay, Look, guys. I'm a side note. Let me just pause that. For some reason, I have found th- this is doing it every time I pull up BBC. It set the language in pigeon, and y- do y'all see that right there? I think pigeon is a Hawaiian thing, and uh, I'm telling you, like this is the greatest thing ever. So, I mean, like the the way pigeon is, it's, it's I, I the first time I pulled up BBC News and pigeon, I thought I was having a stroke because I couldn't even read it. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's there it's doing good and uh but tv joshua did nigerian prophet uh timmy tope balogan joshua wife evelyn uh synagogue ba, ba buhari jonathan morn i don't even know what that says I, I see i thought i was i thought i was having a stroke the first time i read a website and pigeon <laughs> But anyway, let me let me find another. Let's see. I don't know how to. I don't even know how to change that. But anyway, uh, but TV Joshua died this week, and uh, he uh, man, he was actually a big deal. His Instagram account right there, six hundred twenty-seven thousand followers, and uh, so here's here's one of their latest posts talking about how he died and went on. And um, so it says here, uh, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servant, the prophets on Saturday, June 5th, prophet TB Joshua spoke during the Emmanuel TV partners, meaning time for everything, time to come here for prayer and time to return home after the service. Uh, God has taken a servant prophet TB Joshua home as it should be by divine will. His last moments on earth were spent in the service of God. This is what he was born for, lived for and died for. As prophet TB Joshua said, the greatest way to use life is to spend it on something that will outlive it and uh so basically all that right there uh but i want to tell you jo- tb joshua was a false teacher this guy was terrible and i'll say more about that here in just a bit um he out the al jazeera websites in english so i'm gonna read this uh, controversial Nigerian pastor T.B. Joshua dies aged 57. The televangelist who founded a Christian megachurch in Lagos died from an undisclosed cause, his church said. Uh, the popular but controversial Nigerian evangelical preacher Timmy Tope Bal- Balogan Joshua has died from an undisclosed cause, his church said on Facebook. He was 57. The preacher popular known as T.B. Joshua founded the Synagogue Church of All Nations, a Christian megachurch in Lagos. The father of three was one of Africa's most influential preachers with millions of television and social media followers. More than 15,000 people from Nigeria and abroad attend his Sunday services. Uh, God has taken his prophet, we just read that, um, uh, one of the pastor's lawyers confirmed, he said, I confirmed the man of God, T.B. Joshua, passed away on Saturday after his evening program. And uh, so he actually says here that he rose to prominence in the 1990s at a time where there was explosion of televangelism in Nigeria and many parts of Africa. Matter of fact, I've got a Nigerian prince that owes me some money, and uh, that's that we're still waiting on that and whatever. But um, this guy actually was was probably one of the worst people in all of Christianity. I mean, like Kenneth Copeland has nothing on T.B. Joshua. Uh, T.B. Joshua is probably one of the top five worst, most vile televangelist false prophets ever to live. Um, he's in bad shape. Matter of fact, I read the other day that he actually had one of his videos on YouTube removed recently. Like he was he was in trouble with YouTube because these people would come, like he would do deliverance stuff like people come forward and say you know I'm struggling with the sin of of adultery or whatever and uh, and they would like cast out the demon of adultery and the funny thing is like the problem with that charismatic teachings and those charismatic mindsets is that you're you're not repenting of sin you're you're like being delivered from a spirit which is a totally different animal Okay, so like, let's just say hypothetically, I go out and do something heinous. Like, let's just say I go rob a bank. Okay, what I would do is I would go to a TB Joshua type 
figure. And I would say, you know, I, I robbed a bank and, and, and I've got, I've got, I'm struggling with the spirit of greed and violence. Would you help cast the spirit of greed and violence out of me? And they would have some sort of whatever. And I would say, praise God, I've, I've been delivered from the spirit of greed and violence. And, um, and that's how they view their sin is that you know I'm not responsible for what I did because this spirit of of adultery or spirit of lying or spirit of whatever came over me and that's not what the bible teaches like David when he sinned with Bathsheba in Psalm 50 I believe Psalm 51 he was not saying oh god please deliver me the spirit of adultery came over me god I need your help he didn't say that he said he said lord against thee and thee only have I sinned it's different that's not the same. That's why these people are so dangerous. Instead of repenting of a sin, you are asking to be delivered from a from a spirit. And that is a, that's a false gospel. That is that is a different theology and I want to tell you right now that that's 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 damnable. That's what that is. That's a doctrine of devils. That's evil theology. And guys like TB Joshua would preach that. Um, he actually had a YouTube video removed and um, recently because there were people that were coming forward that were like uh, saying that they were struggle with you know like homosexuality or whatever, and he was doing deliverance to them and like he was actually taking these people and slapping them and he was like like he's and I, the video's gone but the reports that I read said that he was trying to slap the spirit of homosexuality out of these people and I thought to myself oh Lord have mercy <laughs> what a what a riot that is. And uh, so, but I have seen, I've watched a lot of his services. Uh, the man, the man ran a cult and the man was a false teacher. Uh, he was, he was a dangerous heretic and a damnable heretic. I don't think he's in heaven. I, I think this man's in hell. And um, he preached a different Jesus, different gospel, different, um, different, I mean, everything he preached was wrong and different. And it was it was just a terrible thing. So matter of fact, he's the one. And please forgive me. I, I'm not I'm not trying to be crude or anything. But like, he would preach in the services, and like they would say the Holy Spirit would move, and then you'd see all these grown African women start convulsing, and and it was horrific. I don't even know how it got on the internet, but I mean, like graphic, like all these women would start literally regurgitating and like would like be throwing up everywhere and it was like it was something unbelievable and and that and when this when this spirit moved to this church i mean you're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of women just throwing up and they said that that was a sign that demons were being cast out of these women so TB Joshua is is a false teacher of the worst kind. I mean this man this man was spooky the stuff he was into. And it's not it's not like he and please get this out of your mind. It is not that brother Spencer was just splitting hairs with these guys. It's not that way at all. Please don't be that dumb. Please don't. Please don't think that I'm just being some jerk. Don't think that these men are preaching something that if you accept it, it will destroy you. Their theology is poison. These people are dangerous. And please stay away from these people. Do not get your life messed up in these guys. They are terrible, terrible things. And so, matter of fact, uh, you know, all my time in Africa working in Kenya, a lot of people ask me about T.B. Joshua, and that's kind of how I got acquainted with his ministry. He would come to Nairobi quite often uh, and, uh, you know, of course, stay in five star hotels. And the man lived like a king and manipulated people for a living. And, uh, you know, all, all I'm going to tell you is, is there's a judgment day coming, there's a reckoning day, there's an answering day. And I think. I think these false prophets are, when they first start out, I don't think that they're really, like, I don't think they are fully knowledgeable about what they're into. But uh, I think when they get to the level like TB Joshua got to, I think they know what they're doing. And I think they've gotten to the point where they don't care. I think that's really the truth. Yeah, it's same, the same with the Illuminati people, the same with the celebrities, the same with the Masonic people. Uh, I think a lot of these people that get into the entry level of this stuff don't they really don't even know what they're messing with. 
And then, but once you get to the upper, upper, upper echelons, like with the Jesuits and that kind of stuff, um, I think they know what they're doing and I think they don't care. I think you have to harden your heart so much and, and sear your own conscience to operate at this level to where you're manipulating this large mass of people. I, I think, I think you know what you're doing and, uh, and I think it's, it's dangerous and scary. So TB Joshua's gone and... You know, whatever. I, I, I'm not going to say too much, but let me just say this. I don't think this man's in heaven. No way. And I say that with a measure of fear and trembling because uh, this, is, this is not a funny thing to me. This is not something I am like, yes, amazing, great. Uh, I don't have that attitude towards anybody, not even T.B. Joshua. But if he believed what he says he believed, I don't see how he saved I just don't. And so that's something that bothers me and troubles me. And so very good there. So let's do this. Let's just take a, uh, a quick break, and we'll be right back. And when we come back, we're going to take your questions about uh, – we, we made a post here uh, for our channel members, and we're going to go – we're just going to go one by one through these, and uh, we're going to take just a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about this. God bless you guys. We'll be right back. Hey guys, your friend Spencer here. The Lord has allowed us to get a Teespring store and me and brother Johnny are drinking some of my wife's famous coffee from this brand new mug from the Teespring store. Brother Johnny, how are you doing today? Doing good, brother. Well, we've got a lot of great products in our Teespring store. Brother Johnny, what is your favorite product that we've ever had from the store? I think my favorite one is the Doctrine Matters shirt. Weren't you just wearing a... Uh, What's wrong, man? Bro, you just, you just were wearing like... You weren't wearing that. I have no idea what you're talking about. There it is again. You just did that thing. Like, bro, you're kind of weirding me out right now. Like that, that. Are you needing me to call somebody for you there, brother? What is happening right now, man? Dude. Rebecca, did you put LSD in my coffee again? I'm getting rid of this junk. Oh, terrible. Oh. All right, guys. Well, let's talk about this for just a bit. We got some channel members who've asked questions. Got uh, we just made a post saying, uh, "Leave us a question. This post will make a video answering them." And we want to try to make good on that. 167 questions. I don't know if I can get to every single one of them, so please, please forgive me. Uh, but I'm gonna try to rapid fire these as best I can. Oh, she said uh, the thought of a question that I've been wanting to ask you for a while. Let's see if I can bring that all on screen here. Um, Let's see here. That's not a, that's not, uh, okay. So, uh, what Susie Smith asked the question, what is the two word phrase you use to the government purposely bankrupts itself to bring in a communist government? I heard you mention before and have gone through old videos to find it, have been able to, well, Susie, the answer to that question is Clower Piven, Clower Piven. And go check that out. That was actually a think tank strategy to uh, some think tanks got together and said, what's the best way to make America a uh, communist nation? Well, the answer was just spend, 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 and bankrupt it and then just implode it on itself, get as many people on a, onto a welfare uh, system as they can and implode financially implode the nation and then on the ashes you can build communism so that that was actually that's a real thing go look that up and uh, that's i mean joe biden right now has got the biggest spending package i think we've ever seen trillions of dollars and uh that is um, that makes you wonder so i'll just said let's leave that out there for you uh sheila eddie says uh, revelation 1823 sorceries in greek is pharmakeia and english pharmaceuticals could this be the jab uh, no, I, I don't think so. Now, uh, it talks about sorcery in the book of Revelation. And uh, let me see here. Um, let's see here. Um, and all sorcerers. Let's see if I can find that. There's, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, Revelation 21 8. There it is. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which, uh, uh, which burneth with brimstone, which is the second death. A lot of the, the word here, sorcerer, is pharmakeo. And a lot of people say we get the word pharmacy from that, which is a medicine. And, uh, you know, you ever seen those old cartoons where, like, they're making a witch's brew and they, you know, add a bat ear and then they add, like, a, you know, whatever. I mean, like a raven's claw and they mix 
mix it into some big brew. Uh, that's That was called sorcery. And uh, a lot of people like to say that modern medicine is a form of sorcery. And, I, you know, it, it brings up a lot of questions in my mind. Uh, for example, a lot of these psychotropic drugs that are there, that are out there today, are nothing more than like crazy. Like they, they, they make some people crazy. Like there was, I know of one family that, you know, they had a family member get on Ambien, which is like, like some sleep pill or whatever. And, uh, and then like, just, just randomly committed suicide and, and nobody, there was no reason for that. And, uh, and so I think a lot of these psychotropic drugs are dangerous and we have to be very careful with that. So that, that's kind of the things that come to my mind when I read that. Um, there are a lot of people, um, the, the oxycodone and the, the pain pill epidemic that we are in right now, man, I'm telling you, these doctors are, are prescribing that right and left, right and left, upside down. And it is scary the amount of people that are on just, I mean, they're on medicines that they don't really belong to. And really a lot of, a lot of doctors are just, I mean, they're crooked and just handing out whatever. And it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. So it makes me wonder about that, but no, I, I, I'm not going to come on here and say that, that this jab is like sorcery or I'm not going to say it's the mark of the beast. I'm just going to tell folks, you need to make a personal decision on that. I'm going to make my personal decision on that. Um, I know that they're pushing this really hard right now. And it makes me wonder what the financial, um, you know, financial implications of all that are. So, all right. So Amber says, let's see if I can uh, find this here. Amber says, uh, I come from a Pentecostal background, but I never was really, uh, never really read the Bible, let alone study it. I was taught that if you spoke in tongues, you had the Holy Spirit. Now that I've actually read and studied, I've come to realize tongues is not what I was seeing happening. And as a young person, it frightened me to have these adults' hands on me taking, uh, talking in these supposed tongues. I thought I was demon-filled because of this, and now I'm starting to think that tongues was for that day of Pentecost and not relevant today. Am I wrong? I mean, the Holy Ghost came over these people for the unbelievers, right? I at least know that this tongues thing happening in a lot of churches, and I know people are wondering why uh, they can't speak in tongues that really can be detrimental to a person. wonder what's wrong with them. I would love to see a video on this. I think a lot of eyes would be open. Um, yeah, sure. You know, you see, uh, someone sent me a video today of Sid Roth, and he was just, all right, everybody, everybody start praying in tongues. And everybody in the room just instantly just starts going, blah, sound like a, an auctioneer. And, uh, and that's, that's not what happened in Acts 2. I'll show you what happened here. There's a sound of rushing mighty wind, and there appeared in them cloven tongues of fire and sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, you have to understand, a tongue is a known language. It's not some habala, It's not nonsense. It's not gibberish. And uh, so they are all they are all speaking in these tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And notice verse six. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. And notice this right here, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So basically, there there was all these languages there at the day of Pentecost. And so you know you got Peter who spoke Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, getting up and preaching, and God gave a miracle of understanding, which was called tongues. Uh, to somebody else who like like there's somebody who's came from like a Germanic tribe and he's there he doesn't speak Greek Hebrew Aramaic and all of a sudden he's understanding Peter and Peter's preaching the gospel so what do you do with that well that that's what tongues is that's what tongues was in the book of Acts chapter two and so yeah I, I think I think a lot of what's going on today is not it's not the Holy Spirit let's just put it that way. And I think your your conclusion in your your uh, what you're saying there is right, Amber. So good job. Um, Hidden Hills Homestead says if we cannot find a biblically sound independent fundamental Baptist church and are considering another church, that is the closest thing we can find to an independent Baptist church. What doctrine is considered essential to the faith? So um, he, here's here's my position on that. Um, and and I can say this because I've done this. But if you are in a place where there is no good church. Um, I I hate to say this. I think it's time to move. I I really do because I I you got to have a, a a heavenly home. You got to have a physical home, and you got to have a church home. And if you don't have that, you're one third homeless. If you don't have a good church, you are one third homeless. And for a lot of people, that's at, that's a high bar for a lot of people to come to. But I I have done that. I mean I I 
I want to, to do that. I want to have a local church in my life. And, uh, you know, I think it's, especially raising kids, I think it's a dangerous place to not have them have that be a part of their life. So, but at the same time, um, you know, I understand that, that I, I probably won't be able to get everybody into a church that, you know, is exactly like I would like it to be. Truth be told, and just all transparency, there are some independent fundamental Baptist churches that I would never put you in because I, I just, you know, just because it has that name independent fundamental Baptist does not mean that it's a good thing. I, I, I you know, I, I'd rather you go to a conservative Southern Baptist church than go to like a Stephen Anderson st- style church. I really would. So, and and Stephen Anderson claims to be an independent fundamental Baptist, but he's he's about as, you know, him and David Koresh are probably about the same level as far as how close they are to independent fundamental Baptist. But yeah, I, I I'll pray for you about that, uh, Rachel. But you know, I just there's some things you got, just some tough decisions you need to make. Um, and I I just I get with, get with my wife on that, but we'll we'll pray for you on that. I I really I really I'm not going to tell you go join some evangelical free church that's conservative. I, I just wouldn't do that. I don't know if my conscience would let me, uh, but I'll pray for you on that. So uh, Lukey says, how do you lead Bible studies with a few men in Christ so it can be most beneficial uh, for our relationship with Jesus? Well, any Bible study I think needs to be done as a ministry of a local church, not just some random thing, you know, much guys getting together. Uh, I think that needs to be done uh, under the leadership and authority of the local church, I think that'd be good. That would be the first thing, and then also I would just say, you know, hey, let's uh, let's stick to what the Bible says, and let's not get into um, let's not get in, you know, like like you don't need to sit there with an open Bible and a, and a Beth Moore book and start reading both of them. You know, really, you don't need to be doing that with anybody. You just need to be getting into what the Bible says. So, I would say that'd be the best way to do that. Uh, ben Bowman said, "Would like to learn more about Baptist history in comparison to other denominational distinctives." You know, I think I'm going to do a video on what is an independent fundamental Baptist. What is a true independent fundamental Baptist? I think I'm going to do that soon. And uh, so, thank you for that suggestion, Ben. So, um, let's see here. Ultra Jazz. Why is God always testing me? Three surgeries in the last three years. I've always trusted Him. Just sent a hardship letter to our mortgage company. Lord willing to keep our home on the land that's been our family since the King of England signed a deed. And uh, why do I seem to struggle? Let's see here if I can adjust this so I can see more of it. Um, Why do I seem to struggle when everyone else's life runs so perfect? Well, Ultra Jazz, let me let me encourage you right there, man. Um, not everybody's life is perfect, and we all go through these valleys where it's just like life has just literally crushed us. You know, we we've all I've gone through that. Many of the people here in the comments section can say that that man, we all hit that low. But at, you know, we have to understand that God sees, God knows, God cares, and we can get discouraged, we can get down, and say, "Oh, it's like God's forsaken me." But the Bible says, "But God is faithful. God is faithful." And you know, kind of like Job, when 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 God finally dealt with Job in the book of Job, he he didn't explain himself to Job. I don't know if you ever caught that or not. He didn't explain himself to Job. He just he just kept saying. Job, where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I did this? Where, where were you when I formed the, the Leviathan? Where were you, Job? And I think what the Lord was trying to do to Job is, is trying to remind him who God is. And I think sometimes we forget that, you know, the God that saved us is the God that can keep us. And I think we forget that sometimes. But I'll be praying for you on that, man. Uh, so uh, Charlene White says, waiting on info about Bible study New Testament. Well, we've got uh, we've got the book of Matthew up for our channel members right now. You can go check that out right now, and uh, that will be available to you. So uh, go check that out. We'll make, uh, we'll make, we've got that available. Just go check the feed there for our channel members. So, all right, let's see here. Uh, Bruce Jensen says, hi, I hear a lot about uh, about." Pecan circles about the revival that is coming in the U.S. It appears to contradict the reaping of God's judgment from our country's increasing lawlessness and rejection of God and Jesus' finished work on the cross. Do you know what they're talking about? She says, I define, uh, Bruce says, I define pecan doctrine as coming from Pentecostal charismatic NAR. <laughs> uh, Pentecostal charismatic, I love that. And uh, one could say it's kind of nutty. Yeah, well, see, uh, a lot of these people believe in the Seven Mountain Mandate, which they believe that the world's getting better and better and better when the Bible blatantly says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse. And uh, and so really it's a it's it's kind of the total 
Bible truth flipped on its head. So, yeah, uh, we we dealt with that in Third Adam. Go check that out if you haven't seen that already, Bruce. And that will be we go in depth explaining all that. And so go check that out. So, Seven um, JC Diva says, could you explain if Greek sororities are demonic or not? I had some ladies attack me in a Bible and girl talk group in Facebook and said they that that uh and I said that they seem to not only have occult initiation rituals but they are grooming people for secret societies without knowing it even if it has the tag Christian on it thank you yeah um these these sororities are are like a a miniature secret society they they yeah they have hazing rituals and initiation rituals um, you ought to go look up the Skull and Bones, which uh, George W. Bush and John Kerry, both of them were bones, uh, Skull and Bonesmen. And uh, so it didn't matter when, when John Kerry ran against George Bush, it didn't matter who won that election because both of them were part of the same secret society. And so they, it, it didn't matter. They were, you know, if you got one or the other, the same things were going to happen. And so, um, yeah, these secret societies, these, these sororities are just like a, a light version of a, of a, uh, of a secret society. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, Joshua Snyder, why is it important for Christians to get married biblically? I don't know exactly what you mean by married biblically, but I mean, the Bible says marriage is honorable and all in the bed and undefiled, but God, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And that's in the book of Hebrews. So yeah, being married is, I mean, it's, you certainly need to be married Instead of just living with somebody, absolutely. So, uh, if you if you're living with somebody and you're not married, that's fornication, shacking up. Uh, but if you you know if you get legally married, then the Bible says marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled. But God, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So you don't want that. So that's that's one of the that's one of the main reasons you want to get biblically married. So um, let's see here. Susie Smith says, "What will happen to Gizmo after the rapture?" I have pets I love very much, and it's hard to think they'll be left behind suffering, but I guess that is how it will be. You know, that's a tough question for a lot of people. What happens to animals? And, you know, I think Mark Lowry, that Southern Gospel guy, was walking around with shirts that said dogs go to heaven for years and years, and I think a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, truth be told, um, the Bible's not super clear on all that. It's really not super clear. Uh, we know that there are animals in heaven, like when Jesus comes back, there will be horses. We'll be riding horses. Uh, it says that in the millennial kingdom, the lion shall lay with the lamb or something like that. There, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of references in the kingdom, especially in the book, in the, uh, book of Isaiah, about animals in the millennial kingdom. So what does that mean? And does that mean, you know, like I'll see Gizmo in the millennial kingdom and he'll be my dog in the millennial kingdom? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I just don't know. I don't, I don't want to speak where the Bible is silent. I just I don't want to do that, and so. But at the same time, I I do want to I, I do look forward to that day with with a positive outlook. Um, I don't want to look at heaven and say you know I, I'm gonna miss my cat or my dog, which you know whatever. But I, I I don't want to look at that and have sadness in my heart because heaven's gonna be everything we could ever want. I mean, in in a spiritual sense. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to say that your dog's going to be there, but I'm not going to say it's not. So the Bible's just not clear, is what I'm going to tell you. And uh, so, I mean, really, there's not a whole lot more I can say. But I take, I take, I take courage in that. And you know, so maybe and Gizmo will be there if he'll ever quit being a pagan and get quit messing with that Joel Osteen cube and actually get saved. That'd be good. So uh, Sue Light says, is it biblical for a woman to lead a children's songs during the church service? Uh, is it biblical for a woman to lead children's songs during the church service? I, I think so. I think that's fine. Uh, I'll show you why. Um, let's see here. The, I'm going to type in the word authority in the New Testament. And here's, here's the, the Lord said not to have a, for the women not to have authority over the man. And, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So... Um, you know, I, I guess if she was leading a choir full of men, I think that would be a little, maybe, I think that would be a little bit out of the bounds according to this verse. But, you know, if she's getting up there and she's, you know, a lot of women run the children's church in a church, and it's, there's nothing wrong with that. 
Um, but I think I think that's where I would put the line is yeah, she's not she's not running men around and she's not telling men what to do. So I don't think there's a problem with a woman leading uh children's songs during the church service. So uh Whitney says, What if your church is part of the SBC, Southern Baptist Convention? You know, I I got this question from a, a preacher that they emailed me and said, uh, Hey, Brother Spencer, I am actually a pastor of a Southern Baptist church. And, uh, you know, all this stuff you're talking about with J.D. Greer and whatever, he said, I don't even know anything about that. And I said, well, praise the Lord, you know. Uh, the truth is, there, there's a lot of Southern Baptist churches out there that are conservative, they're they're good people, and they don't even know anything that's going on on the national level. Um, and and it wouldn't, to me, it wouldn't be like the end of the world if you went and had something to do with that church. Uh, but I, I would encourage those churches, and I do encourage those churches that are like-minded, they're fundamental churches, uh, their doctrine's good, and they're not compromising, going into all this Stephen Furtick type stuff. Um, I encourage them to come out and just just cut that tie and disassociate and you know, quit quit putting your money in the cooperative program, quit putting your money in the Lottie Moon and all that stuff. Just, just be your own church. Just be an independent church. And I, I think that's scriptural and right and good. And I think that's a biblical model. So, uh, you know, someone said the Southern Baptist Convention is doing unscriptural things. And I said, well, it's hard to be more unscriptural than a convention, you know. So, uh, you know, I'd encourage churches like that to go and get out of the convention. So uh, Carrie says, Carrie F. says, would you, let's see here. Uh, Let's see here. Carrie says, would you mind sharing how you give the gospel to someone in person? How do you start the conversation, and what verses do you use? Thank you. Um, you know, I really, I like, believe it or not, I like Ray Comfort's approach, you know, just going and talking about, so you think you're a good person. I, I like that approach, and I, I have used that successfully uh, many times with many people, and so I think that's a great approach with folks, and so I encourage folks to do that. Now, of course, I'm not saying Ray, everything Ray Comfort does I agree with on every little thing of course don't don't be absurd uh but yeah that's kind of how i do it i just try to be a blessing to people be kind to them and just say hey you know i always ask about you know what's your church do you go to church anywhere what's your church background and then i use that to kind of lead into a uh what about you do you are you a good person are you right with god i think that's probably the best way to do it i've and you know some people like there was one guy years ago he would take gospel tracts and he would ball them up you know into a small little piece of paper and then as he was standing on a street corner and as cars drove by, if they had a if they had their window down, he'd take that gospel track and throw it in their window and he'd scream, You're going to hell as they drive by. Um, I don't think that's a good approach. <laughs> And uh, please don't do that, Miss Carey, out there in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Please, please don't do that. Please, I beg you, don't do that. So anyway, all right. Donna Kay says, could you explain dispensational teaching and rightly dividing the word? I have heard preachers say that the Gospels are for the Jews, and we, the church, should only be instructed by Paul's teachings. Well, um, okay, 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a there is a divisional aspect to the Bible where you have to understand that God said this to this person for this specific time, and that that is not like you you don't need to be doing that that actual literal thing right now. Like you know, for example, the uh, you know I always use did you sacrifice your bullocks today? Well, we understand that that's you know there like if you notice after Mary had had Jesus that she was going to the temple. Uh, eight days after she had Christ to offer for her purification, and that was that was a law in the book of Leviticus that you had to go offer turtle doves for, uh, you know, after you had to be cleansed, and there was a lot of there was a lot of cleanliness laws in, in the book of Leviticus. Uh, after a woman had a baby, she had to wait eight days and then go to the temple offer for her purification, um, things like that. Okay, you, you're not doing that today. And I'm not doing that today. And, and, and you know, we don't operate by that kind of stuff because that was for that time. And although the spiritual principles behind it are still true, God's nature has not changed. But God has given a different set of instructions for this day and uh, something, I guess, more, more specific and more, more situationally uh, specific. And that, that's, that, that really, that is, I think that's the key to understanding much of the Bible. And most people just don't get it. They just don't get it. And, and I understand. I, I empathize with them. I work with people. I try to be patient with people on that. But rightly dividing the Word of God is the key. It is the key to understanding the Bible. 
And I'm not saying that I know everything about it, all the ins and outs of that, but uh, when you when you learn to see the Bible divisionally, uh, I think that's when the Bible really opens up, and you start, man, man, that's amazing. I never really thought about that. <laughs> so it's great. Um, Joshua Murray says, how do, how do you get a Jewish person to see the truth about the gospel? Well... Uh, you have to you have to understand where they're coming from, and then you know you have to, like a lot of a lot of people have led Jewish folks to the Lord going to Isaiah chapter fifty three, and said, okay, who who is Isaiah chapter fifty three? Who was wounded for our transgression? Who was chastised? I mean, okay, who who is who is that guy in Isaiah fifty three? And uh, they you know you have to tell them that that's Christ. He is the one that was promised, and if you receive him. Uh, you can be forgiven, and so I, that that's really one of the best angles I've seen people take, and uh, very good. So, hey, let's do this. Let me get a quick break. We'll play just a quick commercial, and I've got something funny I want to show you about uh, Gizmo. You guys remind me here in just a moment, and uh, we'll do that. So, guys, we will be right back. God bless you. Hey guys, your friend Spencer here. I've got exciting news about our new book, From Football to Faith. It is now available on Amazon.com. All you have to do is click the link below. It'll take you to Amazon's website, and you can get your own copy sent to your front door, and uh, that will be a blessing. Uh, in this book, I gave my testimony of how I came to know Christ as my Savior, and a lot of the character lessons that I learned playing football that are applicable to the Christian life. And you'll find many good stories in here that are funny, some that are sad, some that are uh, inspirational. But I'm sure this book will be a blessing to you. Christians young and old will enjoy this book, and I know that it'll be a blessing to you. So go ahead and get your copy today, and we appreciate you guys. And if you haven't done this already, go ahead and subscribe to our channel and look forward to many more good videos together in the future. God bless you, friend. Have a good day. All right, guys, well, let's do this. I want to just take just a moment and show you a funny video I took the other day of Gizmo. And uh, we always try to joke that Mr. Gizmo is a pagan. Well, let me show you something really funny that I did the other day. I tried to witness to him. I tried to tell him about the Lord. And uh, let me show you what he did. Excuse me, sir. Do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Sir, 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 sir. So I tried to talk to him about the Lord. He, he would have none of us. <laughs> <laughs> and I even tried to use Ray Comfort methods on it. It didn't even work. So, uh, <laughs> uh, But anyway, we just wanted to show that to you right there. So, okay, um, let's see here. Uh, Barb Johnson, Luke 11.35 says, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Other scriptures speak of light and darkness not be able to dwell together. Uh, what does the scripture mean? Well, I, I mean, you know, I wouldn't try to read too much into that other than what it says. I mean, darkness is bad, light is good. God is the light of the world. So, um, you know, I, I would just I, really you got to take all that together and don't get one of the keys about the Bible. If you find a Bible verse that you don't understand, don't get hung up on that one verse. Okay, there's plenty of other things in the Bible that we can understand very easily. So just move on to that. Just move on to that, and uh, just. You know, Mark Twain was one of the guys years ago. He said, he says, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the things in the Bible that I do understand that bothered me. And so I think it's a great question there. So uh, Paige says, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, what is uh, the dead here represent? Uh, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Um, the book of Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon. And Solomon writes it from the, from a perspective as of a of a basically from the perspective of a godless person, somebody who lives and has all the pleasure, all the fame, all the money, all the possessions you could ever have, and writes all that and just explains life from that perspective. And so, basically, when he's saying that, he's saying that you know the dead have nothing else ever again. He's writing that from like an atheist perspective, like this life is all there is, and that that's why at the end of the book. He says, "This is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep not and keep all His commandments." Okay, so that is that is the whole point of the Book of Ecclesiastes. It's a powerful book. I, I thank God for that book. It's amazing. So let's see here. Um, David, let's see here. He emailed me a couple questions. Uh, like to know a street preaching that aligns with the Word of God. Let's see here. Uh, and why do people inside the church? not go outside the church and preach on the streets to people who are more worldly instead of preaching to the people already saved. 
or these two different subjects, two different parts. Um, I believe in street preaching. I don't get to do as much of it as I used to, uh, but I do believe in street preaching. There's a friend of mine in Florida who's a lawyer. Him and I are friends on Twitter. He's got a great Twitter account, and uh, he does a lot of street preaching. He tells me a lot of things that he runs into, and he told he told me um, through a message, he said, Third Adam 3, Rise of the Divine Feminine. He said, I am seeing so much of that. It is unbelievable how much of that I'm seeing. So I, I thank God for that. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, this guy made a video saying that you lied. Yeah, I'll just refer back to the beginning of the live stream after for that. So um, let's see. Can you comment on God's expectation for believers confessing of sins in First John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does this refer to a one-time acknowledgement that one is a sinner at the time they become born again, or is a recurring continual confession of daily specific sins? Or is it something in between? So I think I think it's a daily confession. And see, there's there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. Like when you when you get saved, you you are your your relationship with God changes. Okay, you're now a child of God. But in that verse, First John one nine, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins, forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, that that's talking about fellowship, not relationship. Fellowship, and I think if most people, if they would understand that those two are two different concepts, relationship and fellowship, uh, I think that would help them understand things like you know the security of the believer. Um, like for example, they, you and I, I think all of us know somebody who like they had a falling out with their parents years ago, and they're estranged from their parents. Uh, they didn't talk to their parents in a long time. Um, you know, I think all of us know somebody like that. Now, the fellowship has been severed, but the relationship has not. Like, you will always be the child of those people. That is your relationship. That relationship will always be maintained, but the fellowship may not be. Uh, there are people who have brothers and sisters that they have not spoken to in a very long time. That is because the fellowship has been severed, not the relationship. You can't change the relationship. I mean, your brother is your brother no matter what. Okay, your mom is your mom no matter what. Your dad is your dad no matter what. They like you you literally can do nothing about that. The relationship is set, but the fellowship is not. And when we become a child of God, I mean we are we're in. You're in that family. Your relationship is fixed. But that doesn't mean your fellowship is fixed. Your fellowship can change. You can get out of the fellowship with God, get away from God. I, th- I think Samson got away from God when he was when he was messing with Delilah, and uh, it said the wish not the Lord had departed from him. I don't think he, I don't think he lost his salvation. I think he lost his fellowship. And so, but then again, what do I know? I'm just a guy with the Bible here. So David Lovemore says, how's it going in your projects in Africa? Going good, man. We've got a report coming up, and uh, we'll, we'll give you some of that here very soon. We've got a few things in the work. So David also asks, what, is the re- what has the response of third Adam 3 been like? Uh, I, really, it's been overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly positive. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled. So praise the Lord. So James Mount said, how to lead your family in God's way? That's a good question. That's a good, real good question. How to lead your family in God's way? Um, you know, really, it, there's so much on that. I, could, I, I don't know if I could do it justice here in just one sitting. Uh, but, you know, er, if everybody in the home is right with God and doing their God-ordained role in the home, then I... I think everything's gonna be okay, but if you got you know if you got two heads in a home, you're gonna have trouble. Anything with two heads is a monster, and so somebody's got to be the head, and that head has to be Jesus. And then the man has to lead, and the woman has to follow, and the children have to follow the parents. And so I think that's how that should be. I think that's the right way. So more on that in third Adam three. Um, Marla Jolie is healing possible today as the Bible time period. If not, why? There are over 100 scriptures or more that speak of healing. You know, I think God heals people today. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you're a cessationist. You think God doesn't do miracles. Well, I mean, me getting saved was a miracle. So, of course, I believe God does miracles, but not as defined by these televangelists. No. I, and I'm, 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 you know, a lot of people get caught up in this cessationism or continuationism. Um, I, I don't think that what these people are doing as far as these gifts and whatever things that Sid Roth and all these nutcases are into, 
I, I don't think God, the Holy Spirit's into that. I think God heals people. I, th- I think I think people have been given dreadful diagnoses from doctors, went to their church, their church prayed, and God turned their health around. I have I have seen that. Okay, and I'm not a charismatic. I'm a I'm a I'm a, I'm a big B Baptist. Okay, but I think God does miracles like that today. I, I think so. I, I've seen God provide financially for my family miraculously over and over and over again just for me to stay in the ministry. So I believe God's hand of provision is always on time, and I believe God does things like that. And so, um, you know, does God heal people today? Yes, but He doesn't heal people because you sent some $99.99 donation to Creflo Dollar on TBN. God, that's not how God works. He never has worked that way, <laughs> okay? And uh, I just want to throw that out there for free. So um, some Michelle Wee says, someone asked me about Baptists losing salvation. You know, there's a lot of people called, they call themselves free will Baptists, and they believe that you can, uh, they're basically Arminians, and you can lose uh you can lose your salvation. A general Baptist is one who's like a reformed type, and they believe in like the five points of the tulip, and they are they're more reformed Calvinistic. And then the the free wills are uh, Arminians. They believe you can lose your salvation. Uh, Mike, there's a guy on YouTube called Mike Hoggard. I, I know Mike Hoggard. I went to I lived in the same town with him in Festus, Missouri for years. Uh, Mike Hoggard is a good man. He's an Arminian. He's a free will. And uh, so nice guy, loves the Lord. I mean, nice guy. But but yeah, he's he's a free will. And so yeah, I just want to throw that out there. But you know, that's what that's basically what a, a Baptist that loses thinks they lose their salvation is. Um, let's see here. Joyful We says, in all the research you've done making Third Adams, did you come across any CCM artists that you thought were genuine believers? Oh yeah, yeah, a lot of them. a lot of them. Um, the problem was, the problem is that the ones that are good have no discernment. Like, like they 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 absolutely are completely clueless on the Bible. And uh, you know, I, I guess I guess I would say that like casting crowns, those guys, those are nice guys. I, I would guess I would suppose they're saved and love the Lord and go to church. You know. Um, you know, I really, when I was making my book, Calling Evil Good, The Lie of Christian Rock and Roll, it was not hard to find things on these people. Like, like I found things on everybody and I put it all in book and it was not hard. Uh, but man, those casting crown guys are squeaky clean. Like the, there's nothing on the, I could, there's no, there's not even a parking ticket on those guys. And uh, I think they live right, and I think they—I think they're nice guys um, for the most part. And I, I, you know, I mean, I want—I want to be fair when I deal with these people, but I think what they're doing is biblically wrong, and I think what they're doing is is damaging to the cause of Christ. I think they're ruining the next generation, and uh, and so that's my opinion on that. But yeah, I mean, there's there are some people in that that are saved who are who are trying to really make a difference in people, and they have a, a musical gift, and they're trying to use it. Uh, for God, the best they can. Uh, but you know, basically, when they get into when they get into bed with these secular record companies, they 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 really start to spiral and go the wrong direction. It's not a good thing. So uh, let's do this. Uh, we're coming up on an hour and a half. Let's try to get a few more of these in, and we're going to get into several things here. So we're going to try to burn through these. Uh, hey, Spencer and team, this is Mike Socal Creative. I will summarize my email. Basically, how should independent Christian writer illustrator go about writing? fictional stories who apply the Christian life to it symbolically as literally as possible talk or show it all of the pages and how the story is applicable to the real world or parallels it a bit of all as they also have a kind of superhero story in mind that I developed over the years do you think do you also think applying the Christian life to it is okay thank you guys well uh, you know Mike a, a lot of people try to do this and they try to um, you know they like I, I had somebody call me a while back, and they were nice guys, but uh, you know they were they were actually they, they they indicated to me they tried to keep their identity secret, but they they indicated to me that they were very deeply involved in Hollywood and very deeply involved. Uh, I think they reached out to me not long after I did that video on um, uh, that was that lady Dana. She I forget the name of it. I, it's been so long. But there, there's this there's this new Disney cartoon where like this kid was a witch. And uh, I, I forget the name, but I, I did this video and it kind of went crazy viral. And actually the woman who, uh, the woman who was heading up the project, something I said about her in, in that video, she actually made that her Twitter profile and it was, it was pretty wild. But anyway, um, 
so these people reached out to me and asked me, said, okay, like, do you think like the Lord of the Rings and do you think like uh, the Lion, the Witch and the War- Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia, do you think all that, you know, like, like we're reading things, these people are Christians and like J.R. Tolkien is trying to, like the whole Lord of the Rings was just like an allegory of the Bible. And she's and they asked us said you know we're we're wanting to do this we want to, we want to be Christian people who do this as well and kind of create the next Lord of the Rings the next Chronicles of Narnia, um, you know what do you think and I said well you know I said first of all I don't think the Lord of the Rings was an allegory of the Bible I just don't think it was um, and and if it what if it was intended to by Tolkien and I I don't think that was but if Tolkien's intention in creating and writing the Lord of the Rings series was to have some allegory of the Bible. All of that was so pushed into the corner and overshadowed by all the magic and the elves and all uh, just all the elements of it that all that became such a side note to a side note to a side note that is completely insignificant. Now, C.S. Lewis, I think, is probably a little bit more prominent, like you know, Aslan being Christ who sacrificed himself so that he could bring the salvation of the of the of Narnia and all all that stuff. Um, I think there's a better case for that with the Chronicles of Narnia, but I think even the Chronicles of Narnia falls dreadfully short of being any type of Christian uh, type movie. Uh, I think the only person who ever really successfully pulled off, I think, what you're asking me here, Mike. Uh, was uh, was was uh, uh, Mr. Bunyan, John Bunyan. I almost said Paul Bunyan. That's not true. John Bunyan with the Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, Mike, uh, go go on Amazon, get you a copy of the Pilgrim's Progress, and go read that. That is a uh, symbolism allegorical and when uh, it just really like a figurative. It's really it's the whole thing is an allegory. It's it's fantastic what he's saying, and I still think of I, they made us read that in Bible college, and there are times I go through my day I still think of the illustration used in the um, in the Pilgrim's Progress. I, I I see all these people on Instagram, and I think you know this is like the Vanity Fair of Pilgrim's Progress. I think of uh, you know people that are like Mister Valiant for Truth, and uh, so many so many other things that are in that. Uh, I would encourage you to go read Pilgrim's Progress and just do something along the lines of that. That's what I would tell you to do. So uh, Matt Roberts says, how do we reconcile the use of words heretic and Titus? And yeah, I I responded to you on this one, Matt. Let me see what you mean. Um, Let's see here. All right. So uh, Matt asked a question and said, how do we reconcile the use of the word heretic and Titus? which means divisive or schism and the division you tell us we are supposed to be about. And um, so I asked you for a specific verse. You said Titus 3.10. The margin notes in my KJV define it, define it as divisive. Uh, this led me to check the Strong's, which shows the word schismatic. So let me let me look up what you're talking about here. Titus uh, 3 and verse number 10. So uh, a man that is a heretic at the first and second Admonition, reject. Okay, here we go. Let's just let's just. This is a good example of. Okay, if we just take this verse by itself, we're going to miss some meaning. So let's back up and get some context here. So let's start in verse number eight. Uh, but this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou wilt affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. Uh, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So, yeah, I guess so here. Okay, this heretic is one, um, if that does mean that, it would mean a heretic is one who is giving foolish questions and uh, g- about genealogies and, and their contentions and strivings uh, that are unprofitable and vain. And I guess if that's what you mean, it would be somebody who's unnecessarily divisive. And, uh, you know, as, as rigid as I am on fundamental doctrine, I think every Christian should be rigid on fundamental doctrine. Uh, I think there, at the same time, there ought to be some room for some, some disagreement uh, for example, I'll give you this. Uh, I'll give you this, Matt. Like John R. Rice is one of my favorite Bible authors. I mean, he he wrote some amazing books. And and if you ever get a copy of John R. Rice's book on prayer, you will have done yourself a great service. You will learn a lot from that book. 
uh, John R. Rice got into an argument. A lot of people argue with him over over tithing. Like Lee Robertson was the pastor of uh, Tennessee Temple University years ago, and Lee Robertson believed in what they called storehouse tithing, Malachi chapter three. You know, bring uh, bring meat to my house that my house may be filled. And he said that that was the church. And John R. Rice, John R. Rice didn't believe in tithing. Okay, like John R. Rice was death death on tithing. Um. But when he died, a lot of people went, uh, his family went into his records because they were always curious how much he gave. And the man gave over 25% of his income. So I guess, I guess he didn't believe in tithing. He believed giving tithing of 10% was not enough. So he gave 25. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's necessarily a division, a good, div- something that we need to divide over. Okay. Um, there was another, another people tried to fight with John Rice because John Rice actually believed that the church age started in the Garden of Gethsemane. He put that in print. He said that the church age started when Jesus was praying in the garden. Um, some people, I think Harold Seidler even believed that the church age started in Acts chapter 2. Now, I went to Crown College and sat in Clarence Sexton all those years. Clarence Sexton always taught us that Matthew 16, upon this rock I will build my church. That's when the church age started. So you got three different positions there. John Rice said that it started in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then Clarence Sexton said Matthew 16, and then Harold Seidler said Acts chapter 2 is when the church age started. Uh, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> no, and that's not like a fundamental, like essential, like like I'm gonna I'm gonna declare you anathema, and you are you are not saved because you believe the church started Acts two. Okay, that that that's that's pathetic. That would be anybody who would do that would be a total dummy. You, that's just that's ridiculous. Um. But if somebody went around and started causing division over something like that, I think they would probably they I think they would be doing verse number nine here. I think they would be f- fulfilling that foolish questions, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. There's just some things that you know we can disagree over that, and uh, it would not be the end of the world. You know, I mean, I got people who love me, who send me stuff all the time, who are my friends, and they don't believe they don't believe certain things like I do. Not not in everything, but there's there's enough there that we're still we're still friends, and so, and it's okay, it's okay. So yeah, I think that's what that would mean. And uh, but people like that that are going around just unnecessarily just chopping everything to bits all the time um, over stupid stuff. Yeah, they they need to be rejected knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. So I think it's a great question, man. Thank you very much for that. That's uh, I'm glad to walk with that, uh, walk with you through that. So uh, Andrea Rodriguez Rivera says, there is this just one sin that people cannot let go of. They become born again on fire for Jesus. And after an X amount of time, there is one sin that is hard to break the chains. How do these people get away from that? It could be drinking, porn, pornography, stealing, lying, gossip, whatever it is. How to get away from these personal sins that people can't get it out of their brains? It's just one sin and not all of them. I hope I asked this correctly. God bless. You know, um, there is what we would call, what you're describing there, Andrea, is what we would call besetting sins, besetting sins. And it's a sin that we all have a proclivity to. Um, and everybody's different. Everybody struggles with different things. Like, you know, if, if somebody came in here and set a bottle of whiskey on my desk, that would not tempt me in the slightest. I don't have even, I, I'm not even tempted by that. That's That stuff is so nasty. Uh, you know, any, my granddaddy, <laughs> my, uh, my mom's dad, uh, he always told me, even when I was a little boy, he said, son, if anybody ever tells you they drink liquor because of the taste, they're lying to you. He said, that stuff's terrible. <laughs> I remember that as a kid, hearing him say that. Um, and uh, yeah, but you know, you said a bottle of whiskey on my desk. Um, it ain't going to do nothing for me. It's not going to tempt me in the slightest. But you know, there there may be other things, like somebody handed me a honey bun today. Praise God for a honey bun. This thing right here, that thing tempts me. Uh, there was a preacher years ago. Uh, he said this. He said, uh, he said, the only woman that gives me any trouble, that tempts me and, sed- and seduces me, her name is Little Debbie. <laughs> I thought that was good. 
Um, so, you know, I guess we all have besetting sins and, uh, and we struggle with that. And I think that's why, I think that's why, you know, that's good. It really is a good evidence that we're saved. Uh, because if you weren't saved, you just would be like, ah, I, yeah, I do that. Who cares? You know, it wouldn't even bother you. Um, so here it is, Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, let, a, let us lay aside every weight, and notice this right here, and, uh, and the sin that does so easily beset us. And I think we all have that sin. Yours is different than mine. Mine's different than yours. A sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so, how do how do we? I, I I think the answer is in the next verse. What you're what you're asking me here, uh, Andrea? I think the answer is this: is Hebrews twelve two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I think the answer to that is these three words right here: looking unto Jesus. How do I get victory over my besetting sins? Well, I just look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and I tell you what, when I, um, when I, when, when I struggle with my besetting sin, the answer is I gotta look to Jesus. I gotta look to Jesus. I may not be able to get to Him. I may not be able to. I may be so weak I can't even call for Him. But I tell you what, I can look to Him. Even a blind man can look to Him, and uh, I can get that help that only He can give. Looking unto Jesus, that's the only way I can get any strength to conquer my besetting sins. That's the only way I can get any strength to get victory over this old wicked flesh that I, I, I have. That's the only way. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And I think that's what we all need. We need to look to Him. Get a fresh glimpse of Him every day as you read your Bible. Get a fresh glimpse of Him in your prayer time. Get a fresh glimpse of Him as you sing songs throughout the day that remind you of Him. And uh, that's that old song that says, Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. Thank God. <laughs> I, can, I can get a look at Calvary, and I'm blessed, I'm blessed for that. Thank God. Great question, Andrea. I see. How should I continue to repent and follow God's will for my life? Brother James is asking, uh, while living in a home where God is not first, how should I continue to repent and follow God's will for my life while living in a home where God is not first. Yeah, you know, it's tough, James, because a lot of people, you know, we we have done youth work through the years, and um, I've noticed that we we tried our best to get kids right with God, and a lot of them make good decisions, and then they'll go right back in the same home that taught him how to be wicked. It's very hard, but I think I think that I think you can overcome it. I think you can overcome it. And uh, I think we can rise above all circumstances, even even a circumstance like that. You keep looking to the Jesus. You keep looking to Him, just like we have here, Hebrews twelve two. Looking unto Jesus, the Author and Finisher of our faith. Look to Him, and I think God can help you overcome all negative circumstances. So. Eric says this, uh, Spencer, since Pentecostal started in the early 1900s and in the Charismatics in the late 60s and 70s started to grow, do you think that blasphemy against the, against the Holy Spirit for some of the, their practices because it doesn't edify the church? Just don't see how God can be present with their practices. I, I agree with you. Um, I don't know if I would say it was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are in that. Are, I think blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a willful thing where you're, it's, you're, you're, you're willfully telling the Holy Spirit to leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with you ever again. Don't even bother me no more. I, I think that would be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Um, and I think a lot of these people in the, in the charismatic world are deceived. I think really one of the one of the main reasons for the success of our channel is because there's been a lot of charismatic people who have um, responded to the teachings we're given here, and a lot of people come out of that. So uh, I think that's... I, I, think, I think the modern charismatic movement is not Bible Christianity, and I think that um, I think that is it is a, a a faulty, incomplete, false gospel that they preach. But I do think people can respond to that and come out of that. So, very good question, Eric. R.D. says, "Does the church still practice anointing someone with, with oil and calling on the elders of the church to lay hands on and pray for for if you are sick? Is it biblical for a church to give people prayer cloth blankets?" 
Um, well, the last statement of there that you have, is it biblical for a church to give people prayer cloths and blankets? The answer that's no. So let's see here. Uh, does the church still practice anointing someone with oil and calling on the elders of the church to lay hands on and pray for if you are sick? Yes. Um, I've been in Baptist church that it did that. You know, uh, women uh, were sick with something, and, you know, the men came forward, prayed with her. They anointed her head with oil. I've been in churches. I've been in Baptist churches that have done that. And so I, I think that's a biblical, scriptural, right, and good practice. Uh, I think it's in the book of James 5, if I remember correctly. Let me, let me check here, make sure, see if I'm getting this right here. Uh, if anybody's to be sick, uh, let's see. Yeah, here it is, James five thirteen. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Any merry, let him sing songs. Verse 14, if any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. If, if he have committed sins, they should be forgiven him. So, yeah, I, I think that's a, a good biblical practice to do if it's something serious. Now, if you want to come forward for the hangnail, and uh, you know, I got I got the headache and uh, whatever. I think that's probably a, not a good use of the church's time. But if you're, you know, like like if I'm dying of cancer, I'm going to ask my church to pray for me, pray over me, pray God would raise me up. I'm I'm going to do that. And so um, I think that's a good thing. And that's not a charismatic thing, really. Uh, if if it's as long as it's done correctly and biblically according to this passage. I think it's fine. So uh, Gail Sutton said, would you, ex- would you explain the word election in the King James Bible? And the first Thessalonians and other places. Yeah, election is a real heavy one. Um, election, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Some people have explained election so poorly to me that it's it's been something I've had a hard time even understanding myself. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refrain from that question for now. I'm going to come back to that down the road. So um, but I, I'm I I just want to I want to think that one through a lot better before I actually give a uh, answer to that. Uh, Moonlight Melody says, "How do you deal with the idea of soul sleep?" Well, um, you know, a lot of people say I say that like First Thessalonians four, where it says that uh, they that sleep in Christ. Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. Uh, with the voice of God and the and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise uh, first, and uh, then the, we which are alive and remain shall be called to meet them in the Lord. So they call it the dead in Christ, and uh, here we go. The end of verse 15 is what I'm looking for, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So they say that that is a soul sleep, like like they're, they are, their body's in the ground, but their soul is like frozen, like asleep. I don't think that's what that means. Uh, if you understand spirit, soul, body, you understand that that could that 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 gives the possibility of that being more than just a soul. I think I think to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's First uh, Corinthians. Um, let's see here. Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type that in. So present with the Lord. That is First Corinthians. Um, let's see here. Present, some are followed us. Yeah, here, First Corinthians 15, as seen but 5,000. Some remain, but uh, remain in this present, but some are falling asleep. First Corinthians 15, 6. Um, here it is, Second Corinthians 5, 8. This, uh, this uh, we are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, that's talking about your soul. So when you're when you die, your soul leaves your body, and your your soul is with the Lord. Your soul's not asleep. Your soul's with the Lord. Uh, that's Second Corinthians five eight. So that's probably the best verse I would use against that the idea of soul sleep. And I think the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that nonsense. Those poor Jehovah's Witnesses. Those people are so messed up. They're as confused as a termite in a yo yo with their theology. I, I hate it so bad for them, but uh, that's where they are. So um, let's see here. Second Thessalonians, Armand Kruger, not Freddy Kruger, but Armand Kruger <laughs> says, uh, uh, second, second Thessalonians 2, 3 indicates that the falling away must happen and the man of sin must be revealed before the rapture, but the Antichrist is revealed in the beginning of the tribulation period, who he pretends to be, but the man of sin is revealed in the middle of the tribulation period as the desolation of abomination, who really is the man of sin, son of perdition? Uh, so the second Thessalonians 2, 3 disproved the pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, yeah, okay. So the Antichrist is revealed at the beginning of the tribulation, sure. But the man of sin is revealed during the middle of the tribulation, 
appeared at the at the desolation of abomination. Well, okay, so basically you have the you have the seven year period of tribulation uh, cut in half, a three and a half year mark. And so what happens is Second Thessalonians two. Let me go there for you. Uh, what happens is that this this antichrist is going to come in and he's going to just the world's in chaos. The four horsemen of the apocalypse come through. Everything is insane. And he comes in, makes a peace deal, and unites the world under one banner, and everybody's together, and everything's cool. So he's like the great world leader who has created peace on earth. They're going to have their Tikkun and Alam. They're going to have their new age, as new age religion has. They are going to have that for a time. Uh, probably about three and a half years is how long that's going to last. But in the very middle of that, he's going to actually walk into the temple. He's going to let the Jews build the temple again in Jerusalem. There will be a peace deal in, in Israel. He will allow the Jews to go build the temple again and start sacrificing on the temple mount, just like they did in the Old Testament. But at the three-and-a-half-year mark, he's going to betray the Jews, and he's going to walk into that temple and sit down and declare himself to be God. That's what this means. So... Um, Let's see, uh, verse 3, there come a fallen way, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And uh, what happens here, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I, that is going to happen at the three-and-a-half-year mark in verse number 4. So very good question there. I, I Man, that's a meaty question. Praise God for that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Freddy Krueger, for that. Appreciate you so much. Uh, Patrick asked about T.B. Joshua. We dealt with him. Uh, Diaz says, how Christians deal with addiction, and can a Christian be addicted to something? I think a Christian can be addicted to something. I think your body can be bound in sin. And uh, if you don't believe that, you know, try to quit, quite a, try to quit eating sugar. That's a hard thing to do. So I think we're – actually, someone said that sugar is five times more addictive than cocaine and is actually a lot cheaper. Did you? Can you believe that? Somebody needs to check that for me. I, I read that the other day, but it was like a, it was like a meme on Instagram. So I'm, I, you know, it's not like whatever. So I, I just read that in passing. But, but something said that sugar is five times more addictive than cocaine. And I thought to myself, if that's true, that's pretty wild. So um, – Let's see here. Uh, let me go to Vessel of Christ. Uh, okay, so question is, just sum it up, should we be saying Godhead instead of Trinity, considering the roots of where the Trinity started? I know the Prince of Preacher Spurgeon used Trinity, but it's not found in the KJV Bible. You know, th th that's the trouble we all have is that um, a lot of us use words that are not in the Bible, but, but they're still okay. Like, for example, the word Bible is not in the Bible. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but I think under I think we use that word to demonstrate what we're talking about. Uh, you know, the the catching away probably would be a, a more biblical term for uh, you know for the rapture, but I, I must still use the word rapture. And I, I guess we can get into some trouble when we don't use biblical language for biblical things. I think that's I think it's fair to say we can do that, but uh, you know, the word Trinity, I don't think it's I don't think it's like I don't think it's dangerous and bad to say the word Trinity, uh, but I do agree. Maybe maybe Godhead is better because of you know, of course, the Bible version, the Bible usage of that, and uh, for in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I, I think I think you're right. It probably would be better to say that, uh, but you know, I, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for a lot of people. It'd be I guess it's just a bad habit we all have, but I think we all know what we mean when we say that. So, very good question there. So, uh, Anna Sanders, let me just do two more guys, or two or three more, and then we're going to jump off here for tonight. We're almost at two hours in this live stream already. I have enjoyed myself, by the way. You guys have been a blessing. And uh, so here, let's see. Um, what did Jesus mean in Matthew 24, 34, when he said, This generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled? Uh, also, a very important question. How is Mr. Gizmo? Has he recovered from eating that frog? Yes, he has recovered nicely from eating that frog, and I think he has gotten immune to them. So, uh, Matthew 24, 34, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Um, yeah, a lot of people are saying that that is a prophecy of the nation of Israel. Um, let let me refrain from that one right now. There's a thing I want to verify one or two things I got in a book over there before I answer that. But I think that's a very important question. That does have to do with prophecy for Israel. And uh, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. 
there's a there's a lot of numbers there as far as times and stuff like that. And a lot of people are saying that uh, that we are right on the threshold of that. So um, I'll, I'll refrain from that one for now. I want to double check before I answer that one. So um, Michael von Heger says, "Do you think our American political climate is in chaos from the inside?" And civilization will soon collapse as the movie, quote, They Live by John Carpenter seems to suggest something wicked, demonic, and alien is controlling the USA. I just think instead of aliens, demons have taken over most politicians. I guess if you watch the film, it would be easy to see the propaganda using the film is spot on how our American nation has been going for years. As you travel to other countries, did you see how socialism and communistic policies slowly take away people's liberties? Well, uh, communism and socialism does far more than take away people's liberties. It actually takes their very character away from them. Because if you have no incentive to better yourself, you will just become a totally, like, be- like, bottom feeder for the rest of your life and you will actually create generations of bottom feeders and that's what that's really what communism does to people communism is not this like people in these these bless their hearts they're just they're just ignorant but these 19 year old freshmen with a gender study major in college are describing communism as some heaven but if they'd actually read a, a if they would actually read a history book in their life they would realize that communism is a total hell on earth it is it is hell on earth it is a terrible thing and the, you know if you don't believe that go read some soviet history um, especially about the gulags. But um, as far as your first paragraph here, uh, I don't I don't like to shape my worldview by what movies say. I think there's a place for that. I like to shape my theology from what the Bible says. Uh, and movies, you know, movies are whatever. They come and go. But I, I think there's a lot of propaganda in movies. I think there's a lot of conditioning in movies. I think movies, uh, I, I think that the Marvel series is now especially with that Thanos, the Avengers uh, uh, saga that they had, I think that's prepping people to follow the Antichrist, which would be th- which would be Thor. And I think that Jesus is Thanos in that movie. And I think that there's an, there's an occultic uh, mind thing that they're placing in your mind. They're, they're programming you and conditioning you to accept that. And so I think that's going on. So um, let's see here. BSP, let's do this last one. Third request for dealing with spousal abuse and where in the Bible it talks about escaping it, grounds for leaving, being safe, etc. Um, well, let me just put it to you this way. Um, no, There is nothing biblical, holy, right, or moral for a woman to live in a home that is where she is being physically abused. There is nothing holy, godly, and right about that. Uh, if if you are being hurt, if you are being abused, uh, you need to call the police and let the police do what they do. And somebody needs to get locked up. Okay, I, I want to throw that out there to you. And really, I think I think it was the state of Georgia years ago, uh, and I knew this because I was going into law enforcement myself. But uh, you know, they, they police would get a call for a domestic dispute, and they would show up to the house, and this woman's laying there, and she has been beaten to a pulp. And uh, and so they start putting the cuffs on the guy because he obviously did it. And then you know, as as soon as they put the cuffs on him, she just you know she resurrects back to life. And says he no, he didn't mean it. He loves me, and you know, and they'd ask her, said, "Ma'am, do you want to press charges?" And she'd say, "No." And so they actually they actually have a thing now where an officer can press charges on behalf of the state of Georgia. I think they can do that in Kentucky too. If walking to a domestic dispute, you you have, you know, if your wife doesn't press charges, you you can still be charged with a crime against the state of Kentucky. And so, which I think is a good thing to do. And but yeah, there's nothing godly, holy, and right about uh, staying in a home where you are being physically abused. There's nothing godly, holy, and right about that. Uh, now, I want to say I just want to throw this out there as far as a divorce or whatever. Um, a divorce is something. It's like a bankruptcy. Uh, it's the last resort. You don't want to do that until you've exhausted everything else. And so, I, you know, safety is a big issue. Number one, I would tell you, get in a situation where you are safe. Do not put yourself in a position where you are physically harmed. Uh, that is not helpful, right, or good. 
And uh, and matter of fact, I don't know if you guys know it yet, but like uh, Johnny Depp, the actor, you know, the guy that played like in the Pirates of the Caribbean and all that stuff, uh, he was married to that girl. Uh, I don't know her name, but she was. Let's see here. She was the. She was one of those characters in Aquaman, and I, I don't even know her name, but she's she's some famous actress. Well, they got in a big fight, and she hit him, like she abused Johnny Depp, physically abused him, and then you know they've been having problems for a while, so she beat him up, and he left, and apparently somehow Johnny Depp got it on tape that. She said to him, like, okay, nobody will ever believe you that I've been hitting you because you're a man, and something along the lines of that. I'm probably butchering the details of this. Uh, but she she was abusing him, and, you know, it went to court, and all that came out, and she looked like, you know, the the fraud that she was, the snake that she was. So it it happens, man. I mean, time, like women do this today, too. It used to be the men did it, but now the, now the women are doing it, too. And so it's it's wild, but uh, yeah, uh, safety is a big deal. I would encourage you get get out of get out of a situation where you're being abused. Never do that. That's not godly, holy, and right. And I want to encourage you as far as that. So, well, guys, um, you know, I always want to tell you the Lord's good. And the Lord's been good to me, and I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm glad that God has allowed me to live the life that I'm living. I'm, I'm I have no complaints. Jesus has never had a dissatisfied customer. And I can I can testify to that. God's good. I love him. I thank God for the opportunity to live the Christian life. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad that I get to serve at Lighthouse Baptist Missions and be a part of building projects like this and building churches and helping be a blessing to these people. I'm glad I get to be a part of that. And I'm glad that you guys get to be a part of that too through your giving. It is it is great. And I'm I'm thrilled just to be a part of what God's doing. And um Pray for me. Pray that God would have his hand on my life. Pray that God would use me, that he would give me wisdom, and pray that God would be pleased with me. And so we thank God for that. Well, guys, we're going to jump off here tonight. It's been a wonderful broadcast tonight. Thank you for over two hours, and I did it by myself. So, And then we got uh, Diana up here. She's been up there. I think that's why it went so well, because uh, Diana left this uh, wonderful, good, godly comment up there, and I uh, appreciate that so very much, Diana. God bless you, and uh, praise the Lord. So, well, well I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to play a song. And then we're going to go tonight. But we love you all. And uh, if you need me, let me know. We've got our email there for our channel members and you guys. Just let us know if we can do anything for you. We want to try our, best our, the, try our best to spend our life helping as many people as we can. And uh, so if we can do anything for you, let us know. We love you guys. And we will see you on Thursday night. Thursday night broadcast coming up, 9 o'clock p.m. i got a few things I want to talk to you about then as well. So that would be great. God bless you. We love you. And we will see you again soon. Have a good night.
Say